So to create reports, we need the Reports tab. So if we go down here to Reports, and I click on Reports, what you'll see is that we've got a number of pre-designed reports that are already included in Packguard. Some of these you will use a lot, some of these you won't. It just depends on which ones you want and which ones are, are more useful than others. And again, you'll get to know that as you go through. You can also alter, edit, create your own reports as well. So this is a very much a basic list. And I'm just going to take you through what these, these items are on here one at a time. Now, the way the reports work is effectively, let's just do a concise asset list. So I click on the report and to generate the report, it asks me some basic data. So say again, my colleague has asked me for a list of everything that's in the kitchen on the ground floor. So I simply select the client. I select ground floor and I select kitchen. Now we could select between certain asset numbers, but I just want a list of everything that's in the kitchen. We could also select a particular item, so we could have a list of the soldering irons or the vacuum cleaners or the lamps. Uh, we could do that by make, we could do that by model. We could also do it by test status, so if I just wanted to see all the things that had failed in the kitchen or all the things that had passed, again we can do that. Now if there was photographs stored in the database, again we can select whether we want to see photographs as well. So if photographs have been taken, we simply select which ones we want on the reports and which ones we don't. So I've just set this up to give me a basic list of everything that's in the kitchen. So I simply press OK. And it's generated a report. So if I just zoom in, so I can use the little plus and minus signs here to zoom in, or I can select off here to go to page width, for example. And that will show me the report. Now on the report, you can see because we set up our seaward logo earlier we can see we've got the seaward logo at the top of the report this is what we call a concise asset list again you can edit these titles if you wanted it specific to your company and it gives me the details of when we've actually generated the report as well and how many pages there are so there's a lot of information in there down at the bottom we've also got a footer so if we go down the bottom we've also got a footer here and the footer has basically got the details of my organization. So if I filled all that in, that footer information is in there. So let's just go back up again. So what we can see on here is that we've got the client, hotel and conference center, ground floor, and the location is the kitchen. Here's the asset IDs. Here's the descriptions of all the assets that are in the ground floor kitchen. And it tells me that's 12 assets total. So that's a very basic report that I could then do things with. So what can I do with it? Well, we've got the option here to print. So I can print the items. So I can either print the current page or I can print all the pages, whichever I want on there. I can save that. And if I want to save that, I can actually click on Save. And I can select off here that I want to save it as a PDF file. So if I wanted to save that as a PDF image, maybe to send on to a customer, or to send to um, um, to a client, I could simply click on there, click PDF, tell it where to save it, what to save it as, and I can create that as a PDF file. Now, I can also email, similar to what we were looking at before with creating the PAT files and the CSV files, I can actually send that to somebody. So I can click on that link, it will fire up my email system and actually attach that to it. So if a colleague again had asked for a list of everything in the kitchen, I could generate this report and the report would be there ready to send over. So it's very similar to creating the CSV files, but obviously we get a nicer looking report. Now if I just close that report, what we can then do is we can have a look at the different options that we've got on here for the reports. So the first two reports here give me the option to actually create barcodes. So if I wanted some barcode labels generated again for the items in the kitchen, I can select the kitchen off here. There's the kitchen. And if I OK that, what it's done is actually created some barcodes there for the asset IDs in there. So I could either print this out on a sheet of pre-printed labels um, 
or I could actually use this with my barcode scanner, scan the items as I did it one at a time and I've got the barcodes there. So just in case the labels had become damaged or we didn't have barcode labels, I can actually use that with my scanner to save me having to type in the numbers each time. I can simply scan each barcode as I work through the location. Very similar with the barcode list, similar sort of information. So again, I can go for the kitchen. But in this case, it's saying, what do I want the barcodes? Do I want the asset IDs? Or do I want the description? So in this case, I might want barcode descriptions. So I can, again, just have a look at that. And you'll see on there that we've actually got the, the descriptions there. But this time, the descriptions are given as a bar in barcode form. And I can scan those in and enter those rather than having to physically type those in. So barcode-wise, We've got asset barcode labels and we've got a barcode list. So the first two are in there. The next one is the concise asset list, which we used as the previous example. And that's to give me a list of everything that's in the, the location. Um, but again, it gives me asset ID and asset description. So it's quite limited. So the next one is detailed asset list. So the detailed asset list, if I actually click on there, what I can do this time is just to show you again, I will pick the kitchen. And you can see we've got the same options as before. But if I click on there, what we get this time is actually a detailed asset list. So rather than just asset ID and description, we've actually got asset ID, description, make, model, serial number, last test, next test, last visual, next visual. So again, we've got more information in there, hence the term detailed asset list rather than concise asset list. So that gives us options on there. Next one on the list is in-service on hire. So again, if I've used the in-service on hire tabs, there's none used in this database, but if I'd use the in-service on hire tabs, I can do the same sort of reports, but I can filter it by show me everything that's in-service or show me everything that's on hire. So again, I've got those extra little options on there to filter those reports and actually give me the information of what's listed in-service, what's listed on hire. So if I've used those tabs, that's there for me. Next one is very, very useful, and this is the, the concise uh, task list. So as it says task list, this is basically give me a list of everything that needs doing within a set period of time. So in this case, if I actually said give me a list of everything that needs doing between, shall we say, the 1st of, uh, of August, where are we? Let's go for 1st of August. Uh, oops, and in this case, 2016. So from the 1st of August 2016 to, we'll go for the 1st of September. So I can just select these off here, so 1st of September. So we've got the 1st of August to the 1st of September. We can choose full tests or we can have uh, visuals or we can say all tests so I might as well go for all tests and I could pick a particular client or a particular location so we'll just pick the client in this case there's only one in the database so we'll pick the client and if I OK that what it's generated there is a list of everything it needs doing this month so this is effectively my to-do list for the month and we've got these items on here so we can actually see what needs doing this month. So ba basically there's items on here. There's 23 items and mainly this is items that haven't had visual inspection. So again, I can knock off the visual inspections on there. But also we can see these expire on the 16th of the, the 8th for the full test. So we've got some on the 6th of the 8th. We've got some on the 1st of the 8th and so on and so on. So what we can actually do is we can use this as our to-do list effectively. We can work around and actually test these items and then obviously download that. That will correct these and if I ran the report again at the end of the month we'd know that we've actually ticked off all those items and they've all been updated. So this is a very very useful report. This is the sort of report as I say that we would give to a, a PAT test operative at the start of the month and say this is your to-do list for next month. And then towards the end of the month, we can run another one and say, right, what are we going to do between the 1st of September and the 1st of October? So this is very much a sort of to-do list 
and it's a very very useful report that we can actually create and say right what do we need to do this month what testing have, have we got to do so that's very very useful so the next item on here is concise latest test results. Now concise latest test results is generally what we would do after a period of testing, maybe at the end of 12 months, to say what have we actually done in that period. So this is really the report that you would give to a customer to say, right, we've done all your testing, here's the information, or the report you would give to a manager after a period of time. Could be the end of a month's worth of testing, could be the end of 12 months. So if I just go on to here, what we'll do is I'll set this up, um, actually say, right, what have we done between the 1st of September 2015 and the 1st of September 2016? Again, we could filter this by particular client if we wanted to, so we can actually get that information. But generally, in this case, what have we done over that period? So let's have a look. So we run the report takes a little while to go through the data and there we go we've got the report here so if I just go to page width now what we can see again this is quite a good layout of report this is really what we would expect to see or the customer would expect to see so we've got asset ID we've got the description who did the test what tester and the serial number what date was it tested on what's the retest period when is it next due and did it pass or fail so that's really all the basic information that a customer would want to know for their assets. Again, this is broken down by client, site, and location. And down the left-hand side here, you can see the various pages that we've got. And there's actually 36 pages to this report. It's quite a big report. And we can go through and actually see location by location, in this case, bedroom by bedroom, what items are actually done, and... The information on that and again if this was going to the customer then we can either save it as a PDF or we could email it straight to the customer straight off this or a manager straight off this this report so we can actually give that information pretty much instantly just by generating the report concise test history is a very similar type report um, just slight different layout so if I just run that one again we'll see it's a similar Similar report, just again, slight differences in the layout. We've got asset description, sorry, asset ID, asset description, user, test instrument, date and results. So again, very similar information, just laid out in a slightly different way. Detail latest test results. Detail latest test results is quite good because this actually tells us um, details about the tests that were carried out so the actual pass fails the actual results and I find this one very useful to filter this by the test status so if we put this on fails this will show us what failed within that period so it's interesting to actually see the fails because we want to know why is it failed what particular test did it fail so these are the items that failed within that period of time and we can actually have a look in here and we can see what's gone on. So in this case, we'd actually got uh, a tower fan and it's failed on visual inspection. And we can actually see in the comments here that it had a ripped flex. So again, that gives us a lot more information in there to actually see what's going on. And if we go through, again, a lot of these are visual inspection failures. So we can actually review particularly what are the the reasons why they failed, what was the actual um, comments that were put down. And if we'd actually got um, failures to a specific test, we could see which test failed, and we could actually see the particular um, test results to see why these things failed. These items all seem to be visual failures within here, but it's exactly the same process if we were looking at um, items that had failed in more detail. If I just close the report down and we'll just open the report up again and I'll say right actually just show me um, the items for um, let's have a look at the kitchen again now so if I actually just say right um, I just want to see the items in the kitchen I'm not worried whether they've passed or failed I just want to see all the items in there so if I just okay that what you can see now is that we've actually got if I just page width so what you can see, the detailed latest test results actually gives me more detail. So I can see the individual tests, I can see the individual results 
and the pass is on there so I can actually get a better idea so for more technical users this is quite good information to actually see what test has been carried out what were the actual readings and we can go into a bit more detail so the concise latest test results is really one that we'd sort of hand to a, a customer that was maybe more non-technical but the detailed test results are good for more technical users where you can actually see the numbers you can actually see the results and we can get really into the detail particularly for items that have failed next one again detail test history very very similar uh, just again slight different layout so we'll just uh, run that for let's just run that for the kitchen again So you can see there, very, very similar, just a slight different layout to the form, just a different look to it, some customers prefer. Electrical test summary, again, very similar, but just a slight different format. You can see on here the items that were, were tested. And what you actually get on here is we've got the asset ID, we've got description, whether it passed or failed, the test date. And then what we've actually got is the range of tests that might have been carried out on the item. And if it passed, we've got a P. If it failed, there would be an F. And S is for skip. So in this case, if we didn't do a polarity test on this particular item, it tells us S that that test was skipped in this case. So again, it just gives us a bit more information about the particular assets and it's just a different layout of form so if you prefer that layout you can obviously use that item now test certificates test certificates are a very useful function so what we can actually do is we can issue either pass or fail certificates if we want to for individual items so I could put the serial number in for the item I could um, actually select particular types of items but what I'm going to do now is just do certificates for all those items that we did over that 12 months within the kitchen so if I just OK that what we get in this case is a sheet per item and we actually get a certificate for the particular item so it says test conducted by on behalf of site location gives us the details and the, the test results the comments and it actually gives us an overall pass and says who the test was carried out by and what I could actually do is I could print the certificate out I could sign it or we can actually add an electronic um, signature into there so it just create a an electronic image of a signature on on each of these certificates and what we've got is certificates there for each item so if your customer actually wanted to go to that level or this was an extra service you were going to offer to your customers for an extra charge you could generate individual certificates for each items now because nowadays we don't necessarily need to print all these out we could just save that as a PDF and keep it as electronic records it is easy to actually generate certificates for all the items you've tested because again it can just be saved as a, a nice easy PDF file uh, no need to print out pages and pages and pages of information so the certificates are quite good we can run them for past items we can run them for all items within a location they are particularly good for failures as well so we can filter it by failures and actually just look at the the items that have failed and actually issue failure certificates so the test certificates are very useful for that uh, purpose next one on here is test instrument details this will just give us a list of all the, the test instruments that we've got and again in this database we've only actually got one um, that's registered on there so again there's just a supernova elite and it gives us the serial number but if you've got a lot of test items it would give you the details and it also gives you the calibration uh, dates as well for those particular items so if you've set all that up that'd be quite useful Certificate of testing. Now the certificate of testing gives us a certificate for a particular site or location. So in this case, uh, let's go for the first floor. Um, and we can put on here, issued by Seaward. So you can put a little comment in there. We can OK that. And it will actually generate a 
certificates for a particular location. Now the slight problem with this is this is okay if we're doing a small location where all the testing is done at the same time every 12 months. But if we've got a location like this where we're on a rolling schedule and we've got items that were out of date, you'll notice that it picks up the date here for items that are out of date. So if you have got out of date items in the in the particular location, it will limit the date that it actually gives you on there so we would need to make sure everything was up to date before generating the certificates so that that again is just a matter of checking our database over and making sure everything's up to date before we can issue the certificates but again this is another service you can offer to pat testing customers maybe print this out put it in a frame and then they've actually got that for for um putting up in the foyer of the building or whatever and they've actually got certificates of pat testing on there so another form another service you can offer now, something else you can do with PackGuard you might not have thought about is invoicing. So, if I actually go on here, what we can do is we can actually create an invoice um, using PackGuard. So, if you're actually doing this as a, as a paid service for customers, you can quite quickly generate your own invoices. So, if I just pick my client off here, and I've actually done the pack test in this 12 months, so we'll leave that on for the period that we've done the pack testing for. We can actually put our rates in here, so how much we're charging per test. So in this case, I've actually put it in as £5 per test, but again, you can pick whatever whatever feature you're on there. If you're VAT registered and you want to add VAT onto that, you can put the rate of VAT in. You can actually put the currency in as well. Uh, you might be working in Euros maybe, so you can change the currency. Um, we put in the period that we're testing between. You can put your specific invoice number. So if you want to keep your, in, your invoices sequential, you can put the number in. If there's an order ref, so there might be a purchase order from the customer, we can put the purchase order ref in there. If there's additional items like a call-out rate, we can put a price in for that or maybe fuel, that sort of thing. Uh, you can give a discount if we wanted to be generous and give a discount of 10% on there. And there's also additional notes that we could put in there, uh, maybe payment within 30 days for example whatever we wanted to actually add in there we can put that information in so what PackGuard will do is it'll have a look at what testing has been carried out um, to the hotel and conference center between these dates multiply it up by the figures that we've got and generate the invoice so all I have to do now is press OK and what we actually get there is the invoice So we've got the details on there. If I'd entered the client's details, those would be in there as well. Uh, we've got all the details we've put on. We've got the dates. And what it's done is it's looked up between the dates. There were 722 items multiplied by £5. And the other items on there, my one-off call-out call fee, multiplies it up, knocks the discount off, adds the VAT on, and actually gives us a figure. So generally, straight away then, we could either turn that into a PDF, we could email that straight to the customer as a PDF, or we could print it out, stick it in an envelope and post it off directly to the customer. So again, it makes this all very easy to do, very straightforward, straight out of PackGuard, and actually makes your administration a lot easier. For those of you who aren't doing pack testing directly for customers and maybe doing this internally, again, this could be a useful thing for accounting purposes to pass on to the accountants to show what pack testing we've actually done in particular areas and things like that. Or if you do do pack testing for internal customers, maybe you've got franchisees like a canteen or a creche, again, you could do any pack testing you've done within those areas. You could actually do that. Or if you've done the testing for subcontractors, maybe you could generate a, an invoice. Now, very similar to the invoice, if we actually have a look, is list of charges. Now, the list of charges actually gives us a breakdown of how much pack testing has cost us in various areas. So again, if I just go in here and I'll just pick the conference center uh, between the certain dates, and basically we can run the report then, and we can see what pack testing has gone on within the conference center over that period of time. So if I put this in as page width, we can actually see what different areas have cost. So we can see in here that over that period of time, within the kitchen, we have actually done uh, one full test uh, on the 23rd. We've done three full tests 
on the 21st there of November. So that subtotal is four tests within the period. That's been multiplied up with VAT. That's actually come to a total for the kitchen for that period of time, that 12 months of £24. So we know what it's costing us within the specific areas. So again, if I scroll through on here, we can actually see the items as we go through the meeting rooms and we can actually see what it's costing us within specific bedrooms how much it's actually costing us per 12 months so it gives us a good idea or gives our accounts department a good idea of what we're actually spending on pat testing and we can actually use this for internal billing we can use this for estimation we can use this for quite a few different items to actually see what it's cost and either how much we've saved the company by doing this pat testing ourselves or what it's actually cost us internally and we can account for that and actually you know adjust our room rates maybe accordingly to allow for that or our overheads and if we look down at the bottom we actually get on here a little bit of a total so you can see on here that we've actually got a grand total at the bottom and it gives us the figures to tell us exactly what the pat testing's cost us for that period of time so very useful report that financially and actually quite useful for organisations where you do want to quantify the cost of PAT testing and maybe you've got internal cost centres, internal invoicing and you can actually use that report to show exactly um, where the money's been spent. Next ones are quite straightforward on here so really client details is just a list of the clients that we've got and in this case uh, there's only one client in that database and we didn't put any details in for it so again straightforward but that would give us a list of all the clients that we've got with their addresses phone numbers etc personnel details so again who have we actually got that's done testing so in this case we've got Matt John and Drew and again there could be details put in for them Short code details, this is basically just a list of any of the short codes that we've set up. So ket equals kettle, toe equals toaster, etc, etc. So that just tells us the codes that we've actually used and we've got active in this case. Site details, again, will give us a list of sites. So ground floor, first floor, second floor. Summary of tests is quite a useful uh, uh, quite a useful report and this actually allows us to have a look at how we're performing really as PAT testers. So if I just run the report, I'm just going to leave it wide open but just set for that 12 months period. What it actually tells us here, if I just go to page width, is that we've actually done, in this case for that period, we've actually done 724 tests and out of those we actually had 16 failures and they're all visual failures so again that's quite a low visual failure rate really out of 700 items but what we could do is we could work out our failure percentage and we could see whether maybe it's a realistic figure or maybe we've been missing stuff um, you can see from this that we've actually had no instrument uh, failures so we've actually haven't failed any of the the instrument tests uh, and again, maybe we could look into why aren't they failing any instrument tests? Is it just we haven't had any? It's a low risk environment or maybe it's the way we're testing or something like that we can have a look at. There is information here on the passes so you can see which tests we've actually been applying most. So generally a lot of insulation resistance testing, a lot of visual inspection. Uh, we can see the retest periods that we've been using a lot. So there's quite a few items there that maybe haven't got retest period set, so maybe we can look into that. Obviously, most things it looks like we've been giving 12 months. And again, we can look at those frequencies and see where that's correct. We can also look on here to see how many sites and locations we've got and maybe see whether we can alter the structure to make that a little bit more accessible. But generally, this is really a good one to look at where your failures are coming from. And trying to identify maybe with other reports like a detailed asset uh, um, test list to see exactly what uh, the failures have been and where those failures have, have actually occurred. Test sequences again just gives us if we've got any bespoke sequences um, actually in the database which we haven't in this case just give us a list of test sequences used um, bespoke sequences used with the supernova 
and universal risk assessments if we actually carried out any universal risk assessments again it will give us a list of those there so if we've done universal risk assessments with the Apollo 600 that would actually give us a list so this is all the the standard reports that are in here um, but we have got the ability to actually alter these reports so if we wanted to go in what we can do if I just actually right click on a report you can see on here we can edit it we can copy it we can delete it or we can actually restore it back to the original condition if we've altered it and we don't like our changes. So if we were going to edit any of the reports, what I would do is say copy it, create a copy and then alter the copy. But in this case, I will just show you um, on the edit tab here if we just click edit. Now what we've got here is a, an actual edit view of the report. And there are various tabs here. We can look at different different views to do different things um, and editing the report is quite difficult um, it's not straightforward it's an advanced feature there are some guidelines included uh, with PackGuard um, but it is quite a quite a difficult activity however it is easy to do one or two basic changes so if my logo wasn't fitting on particularly well what I can do I can click on the logo I can move it left or right a bit I can change the the size of it maybe a little bit just to actually make it fit on a bit better so things like that we can do quite easily if I wanted to change the name of the report again I can just click on the actual element there again click on it and I could actually change the name of the report if I wanted to to actually make that more sort of suited to my company um, so little tweaks like that we can actually do quite easily but actually changes to the structure and things are quite a an advanced feature and a bit beyond what we're what we're talking about today but um, feel free the items are there there is there is backup on it so you can actually read the, the tutorials and go in and try and actually alter and amend these reports to get them exactly how you want them change some of the colors and things like that so the reports are there and a lot of our customers have created bespoke reports to suit their organizations so the options are there it's just an advanced feature and something really that you've got to play about with or maybe get your IT department to play about with for you.